Frank Finlay in The Man Who Was Sherlock Holmes, a feature to mark the 50th anniversary of the death of Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, written and presented by Michael Hardwick. What is it? There's a person to see you, sir. A person? Well, I said you mightn't be at home, but he would insist. Oh, a patient, is he? I don't know, sir. Yeah, thank Any... you, my dear. Thank you kindly. Who? Oh, <laughs> it's you. Sir? All right, Helen. Thank you, sir. May I ask hey, when I what you think to you see you step into this house earlier, I thought to myself, there's that kind gentleman that I was a bit sharp with when he nearly bowled me over in the street this morning. I must go up and apologise to him. Oh, think nothing of it. Not many would have troubled to pick up my bundle of books the way you did. <laughs> Dr. Watson? You know my name? Your brass plate, sir. Ah. Oh. Uh, perhaps you're a book collector yourself. Uh, not really. Uh, I nice enjoy bargains reading. here. Uh, British birds, Catullus, the Holy War. I'm sure. Just fill the great... gap in that bookcase behind you. Gap? I don't see a... Beautiful condition. All of them. Holmes. It, it can't... Oh. Dear me. I do believe he's fainted. Watson? Watson, my dear old fellow. Dr. Watson, of the stout heart and dauntless courage, had fainted. It was the first time in his life, and so far as we know, it was the last. While his back had been briefly turned, the seedy old bookseller's disguise had been cast off to reveal the man whose death, Watson, and the great British public had been mourning for years. The news of that death in 1893 had brought national lamentation. Gentlemen in the city of London had gone about wearing black mourning bands. And at Holmes's return in 1903, there was corresponding rejoicing. Queues formed at railway bookstalls when each new number of the Strand magazine came out. Each new story was avidly read and discussed at firesides, in clubs, in lawyers' chambers, in railway carriages. It was like the Pickwick Papers sensation all over again. So, who was this Sherlock Holmes who could wield such influence not only over our staid and unemotional race, but throughout the world? And what manner of man created him and also achieved so much else in his life? During my long and intimate acquaintance with Mr. Sherlock Holmes, I had never heard him refer to his relations and hardly ever to his own early life. And this reticence upon his part had increased the somewhat uh, inhuman effect which he produced upon me. <coughs> From what little you have told me, Holmes, it seems obvious that your faculties of observation and deduction are due entirely to your own systematic training. To some extent only, my dear Watson. My ancestors were country squires who appear to have led much the life as is natural to their class. Mm -hmm. But my grandmother was the sister of Vernet, the French artist. Art in the blood is liable to take the strangest forms. Arthur Conan Doyle, too, came from a long line of country squires, Irish ones on his father's side. His mother, Mary Foley, could trace her ancestry back more than 500 years, and there was plenty of art in his blood. My grandfather was John Doyle, who came to England from Dublin about the year 1815. He made a great reputation as a political caricaturist under the initials H.P. All his four sons inherited his artistic power. The third of them, Richard, was a celebrated Dickie Doyle who designed the original cover of Punch and did many of his whimsical cartoons. His younger brother, Charles, was my father. He worked in the civil service, but he supplemented his limited means by his drawings and paintings. In my opinion, he was the greatest artist the family produced, but his work was done spasmodically. He had a very peculiar style of his own, like some of the pre-Raphaelites. He was concerned on the one hand with fairies and other delicate themes, and on the other with wild and fearsome subjects. 
but all underlain by great natural humour. Unfortunately, the family did not reap much benefit. He was quite unambitious and impractical. In fact, he was epileptic and alcoholic. Many of his married years were spent in institutions, but he went on drawing and painting in that strange, fantastic style of his, sometimes charmingly fay, sometimes disturbing. My parents were living in semi-poverty in an Edinburgh cul-de-sac when I was born in 1859. There were two of us boys and five girls. We each did our best to help those younger than ourselves, but it was my mother, my dear mother, who bore a long, sordid strain. I said to her, when you're old, Mammy, you shall have a velvet dress and gold glasses and sit in comfort by the fire. Thank God it so came to pass. And it was largely due to her that it did. Mary Doyle didn't only nourish this favourite child's body. She fed his mind with her beloved tales of chivalry, knight's errant and courtly love. She could chat about the Goncourts, Flaubert and Gautier while she did the cooking. And when she'd a free hand to hold a book, she read aloud from Walter Scott. My real love for letters, my instinct for storytelling, springs from my mother. The vivid stories she would tell me stand out so clearly they obscure real facts of my life. She had, I remember, an art of sinking her voice to a, a horror-stricken whisper, which uh, it makes me goose-fleshy even now. I became so rapid a reader myself that the library we dealt with refused to change my books more than twice a day. I wrote and illustrated a little adventure story about a man and a tiger. I remember remarking to my mother that it was easier to get people into scrapes than out of them again, which I suppose was somewhat prophetic of me. Arthur Conan Doyle, and by the way, the Conan came from his godfather, he had a hard time as a schoolboy. He was beaten and bullied by his teacher, but with the other boys, and they were tough boys, he could hold his own. If there is any truth in the idea of reincarnation, I think some earlier experience of mine must have been as a stark fighter. I rejoiced in a battle. But though I was pugnacious, I... I was never so to those weaker than myself. Indeed, some of my escapades were in their defence. Chivalry in action already. He knew how lucky he was to have such a mother. He might have taken from his Celtic forebears a legacy of lawlessness and spent it in violence. But Mary Doyle taught him to idealise man's strength, and it was she who influenced him to sublimate it through words. I have always held that a writer cannot spin a character out of his own inner consciousness and make it really lifelike unless he has some possibility of that character within himself. Which is a dangerous admission for one who has created as many villains as I have. His higher education was at Stonyhurst, which was the country's principal Catholic school, and both the Doyles and the Foley's were Catholic lines. He could have gone there free if his mother had agreed to dedicate him to the priesthood. She couldn't afford to refuse, but she did. And the more extreme demands of the Catholic faith were too much for her. He went on to study medicine at Edinburgh University, and he ended five years there with modest distinction as a Bachelor of Medicine and a Master of Surgery. But more than one of his professors was to be astonished later by the use he made of them. Most vividly of all, there stands out in my memory the squat figure of Professor William Rutherford, with his Assyrian beard, his enormous chest, his singular manner, and his prodigious voice. Gibberish! Did you think you could match cunning with me, young man? You, with your walnut of a brain. You infernal scribblers. You think you are omnipotent, don't you? That your praise can make a man and your blame break him. We must all bow to a journalist and try to get a favourable word, mustn't we? This man shall have a leg up and this one a dressing down. Creeping vermin! You've got out of your station, lost your sense of proportion, swollen gas bags! Well, there's one man who is still your master. You were warned off, but you would come, and George Edward Challenger will put you in your proper place! Out with you! Professor Challenger, scourge of journalists, skeptics, and the scientific establishment, was Conan Doyle's favourite of all his characters, the Lost World, The Poison Belt, The Land of Mist, they're as seminal to science fiction as Sherlock Holmes is to the detective story. And like Challenger, Holmes owed direct origin to one of those Edinburgh professors. Joseph Bell, surgeon at the Edinburgh Infirmary, was a very remarkable man. 
He was thin, wiry, dark, with a high nose, acute face, and penetrating grey eyes. His strong point was diagnosis, not only of disease, but of occupation and character. He often learned all about the patient by a few quick glances, to the delight of his students. Well, my man. Aye, sir. You've uh, served in the army? Aye, sir. Not long discharged? No, sir. Ah. A, uh, a Highland Regiment? Aye, sir. Non-commissioned officer? Aye, sir. <laughs> Stationed at Barbados? Aye, sir. Thank you. If you'll wait outside, you'll be, you'll be seen. Ah, uh, do you see, gentlemen? He was a respectful man, but he did not remove his hat. <laughs> they do not in the army, you know. But if he had been long discharged, he'd have learned civilian ways. <laughs> his, um, his speech is Highland, and he has an air of authority, though he's not uh, an officer in type. Therefore, an NCO. <laughs> what, about, what about Barbados, sir? Well, his complaint was elephantiasis, which is West Indian. Oh. <laughs> Dr. Watson, Mr. Sherlock Holmes. How are you? You've been in Afghanistan, I perceive. Yes, I... How on earth do you know that? I arrived at the conclusion without being conscious of it. Here is a medical gentleman, but with the air of a military man, clearly an army doctor. He has just come from the tropics, for his face is dark, which is not the natural tint of his skin, for his wrists are fair. He has undergone hardship and sickness, as his haggard face says clearly. His left arm has been injured. He holds it in a stiff and unnatural manner. Where in the tropics could an English army doctor have seen so much hardship and got his arm wounded? Clearly in Afghanistan. Young Dr. Conan Doyle had his own hardships to endure before his recollections of Joseph Bell sounded that happy echo. He found a practice in the Portsmouth suburb of South Sea. I spent a week noting down empty houses and finally settled at 40 pounds a year into Bush Villa. I went down to a sale in Portsea and for about four pounds secured quite a lot of second-hand furniture. I lavished all my care upon the front room to make it possible for my patients. The back room was furnished with my trunk and a stool. Inside the trunk was my larder and the top of it was my dining table. I rigged a projection from the wall upon which I could rest a pan over the gas jet. In this way, I cooked bacon with great ease, bread, bacon and tea, with an occasional saveloy, what man could ask for more? I found I could live quite well on less than a shilling a day. I settled in to await my patients. And he waited. He watched passers-by stop to read the brass plate, which he polished himself every day. But they were all healthy enough to walk on again. I picked up a patient here, a patient there, sometimes a newcomer to the town, a one who quarreled with his own doctor. Some of the tradespeople gave me their custom in return for mine. There was a grocer who developed epileptic fits, which meant butter and tea for me. Poor fellow, he could never have realized the mixed feelings with which I received the news of a fresh attack. He took in a resident patient named Hawkins. He was a young man suffering a mortal illness, and he died within a few days. But the doctor had become attracted to his sister, and he married Louise Hawkins that same year, 1885. She had a small income of her own, and life became somewhat easier. During the years before my marriage, I had, from time to time, written short stories, which were good enough to be marketable at very small prices. And I had filled notebooks with ideas and all sorts of knowledge I had acquired. After my marriage, my brain seems to have quickened them. Both my imagination and my range of expression greatly improved. Two or three of my tales were accepted by the Cornhill. The thought that I had won my way into that splendid magazine with its traditions from Thackeray to Stevenson pleased me even more than the checks. I began to feel I was capable of something crisper and more workmanlike. I thought about a detective who, by his gifts, would transform his fascinating trade into an exact science. I remembered the methods of my old teacher, Dr. Bell. A detective, only a, a man in private practice using his own methods. People take their problems to him 
Even the official police, when they're baffled, are consulting detectives. Oh, what a splendid idea, Arthur. Only... Only what? If he's to be so clever, doesn't it mean that you must know all about investigating crimes too? You'll have to solve the problems before you can make him solve them. Do you know, I fancy I could. Uh, it's... It's like medicine. A patient comes to me with a pain. He doesn't tell me what's wrong with him. I tell him. I discover his symptoms, trace our origin, and prescribe a cure. Only my detective will reach his results the way Joe Bell got his afraid coat sleeve, the worn trouser knee, the callosities of the finger and thumb. Any of these might give him a clue. How original. A bit like Poe's Dupin, but with this extra quality. Well, shall you give him a wife, someone to listen to his deductions? Not a wife. With all due respect, my dear, I wish him to enjoy complete freedom to act. Well, I now, must now, say. Now, he must be able to declare I shall be back for dinner at 7.30 the day after tomorrow. <laughs> now, what wife do you imagine accepting that? Oh. No, he, he'll have a companion. A man, of course. Someone to argue against his theorizing, share his adventures, act as his chronicler. Ormond Sacker. What was that, dear? Ormond Sacker, the chap's name. Well, who on earth has ever been christened Ormond? Uh, I made it up. <laughs> I suggest you unmake it. Something more commonplace. Honest, dependable English. Smith, Brown, Robinson. Getting warmer. I know. Watson. Good. James won't mind. James? Dr. Watson at the Literary and Scientific Society. That's it. Dr. Watson. I, I keep him a doctor. and I, I change James to John. I hope you're not giving your detective an outlandish name. Holmes, after Oliver Wendell Holmes. You'll call him Oliver? Sherinford, actually. Oh, Arthur. Well, I wanted to be something out of the ordinary, most ways. His name as well. But I've, I've been toying with an alternative. Oh, I'm glad to hear it. It comes from a family in Ireland. Sherlock. Sherlock Holmes. Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson. Yes, I think they would suit very nicely. Thank you, my dear. Thank you. And now that I have your approval of the name, I hope... I may be allowed to get on and write the tale. Have you a title for it? A tangled skein, indicative of the threads of mystery I shall weave. Now, mm. don't say you don't like that, because I'm not changing it. Not even for you. But he did change it for himself. A study in Scarlet, the first Sherlock Holmes story, came out in Beaton's Christmas Annual for 1887. It had been rejected by several publishers and he was glad to accept £25 for an outright sale. He never made another penny from it. And to add to his disappointment, it made no stir at all. For all anyone cared, they might have stayed Sherinford Holmes and Ormond Sacker. But one man, an American, did care. British literature had a considerable vogue in the United States at this time for the simple reason that there was no copyright. The author didn't get paid. My Holmes book appeared there in this way, and presently I learned that the publisher, Livingcott, wished me to write another one. The result was the writing of The Sign of Four, and so we have the Americans to thank for dragging Holmes and Watson back from what might have been oblivion. But what really made Holmes the delight of British readers was the timely founding by George Nunes of the Strand magazine in 1891. And in its seventh number, there appeared A Scandal in Bohemia by A. E. Conan Doyle, illustrated by Sidney Paget. And that was when the Sherlock Holmes craze and cult began. I do not wish to be ungrateful to Holmes. If I've sometimes been inclined to weary of him, he's been a good friend to me in many ways. Every story about him needed as clear-cut and original plot as a longish book would do. I would not write a home story without a worthy plot and without a story which interested my own mind. And his interest transmitted itself to his readers, not only to those tens of thousands who'd never read for pleasure before, but to a far more sophisticated public, because just at that time they were looking for something new. At the time when I and so many others turned to letters, there was a wonderful vacancy for the newcomer. The giants of old had all departed, Thackeray, Dickens, Charles Reed and Trollope were memories. Considering the strand, it struck me that a single character running through a series of separate tales might bind the reader to the magazine. I believe I was the first to realize this, and the strand the first to put it into practice. Dickens, Trollope and others had held their readers by presenting their stories as serials. Conan Doyle initiated the series, 
familiar leading characters in a familiar setting, like the radio or television series today. If we're concerned for the resident characters and we're instantly at home with them, whether it's where they live or their office or police headquarters or even in their spaceship, it isn't the story that engages us most, it's them and their world. And if this is true of anything, it is of the Sherlock Holmes stories. It was a cold morning of the early spring and we sat after breakfast on either side of a cheery fire in the old room in Baker Street. A thick fog rolled down between the lines of dun-coloured houses, and the opposing windows loomed like dark, shapeless blurs through the heavy yellow wreaths. Our gas was lit, and shone on the white cloth and glimmer of china and metal, for the table had not yet been cleared. Marvellous. He strove so hard with so much research over his historical novels the White Company and Sir Nigel, Micah Clark, Rodney Stone, and so forth. He chills us with some very creepy tales of terror. He thrills us with Challenger. He charms and amuses us with Brigadier Gerard. But what he creates for us at Baker Street is a world through the looking glass. It's a London where the stinking fog and the sound of the cab horse's hooves are the stuff of nostalgia. Two rather selfish gentlemen sitting with their pipes and slippered ease punctuated by Mrs. Hudson's ample meals, 11 deliveries of post a day, and the occasional sound of some new client's foot upon the stair. And those two gentlemen, one, the companion and admiring looker-on we can identify ourselves with, and the other, the hero figure, the genius we can never aspire to be. And yet, I mean, how do you convey genius unless you're a bit of one yourself? I have often been asked whether I had myself the qualities I depicted. Of course, I'm well aware that it's one thing to grapple with a practical problem, and quite another when you're allowed to solve it under your own conditions. Uh, the fact is, Arthur Conan Doyle really did have a natural genius for deduction and detection. Forensic science was in its infancy in the 1890s, but through Holmes, he helped to pioneer techniques which are now taken for granted. The stories were made required reading by the Egyptian and Chinese police forces. And the French Sûreté named its laboratory at Lyon after Conan Doyle. And his abilities stood up to the tests of real life. One morning in 1903, in a field at Great Wiley, near Birmingham, a pit pony was found with its belly slit. The immediate conclusion of the police was that the man responsible must be George Edelgy, a young lawyer whose Indian-born father was a local vicar. After previous mutilations, anonymous letters had named Edelgy. Another letter, apparently written by him, had threatened similar offences against little girls. He and his Parsi father and white mother were aliens, so of course he was just the sort most likely to go around wounding dumb animals, no doubt of some nameless heathen right. The fact that the already suspicious police had been watching the vicarage during the night of the crime and hadn't seen anyone come out of it was brushed aside. Edelge's footprint, a single one, was found near the scene and there were traces of corresponding mud on one of his boots. Some of his clothing bore traces of blood and horsehair. These and other details were enough for judge and jury. Edelje was sent to prison for seven years. Three years after the trial, Louise Conan Doyle had died from the consumption her husband had battled for years to keep in check. He was left weary, despondent, unable to work. Then one day he read some newspaper cuttings. They'd come from Edelje. He'd suddenly been released from prison without explanation. And the cuttings galvanized Conan Doyle. What aroused my indignation and gave me back my driving force was the utter helplessness of this forlorn little group of people, the colored clergyman, the brave wife, the young lawyer, baited by brutal people, and having the police, who should have been their natural protectors, adopting a harsh turn towards them and accusing them beyond all sense and reason of being the cause of their own troubles. He got hold of every scrap of documentary evidence he found that a piece of the pony's hide, cut off as an exhibit, had been wrapped by the police in clothes confiscated from Edelgy, hence the blood and horsehair. He noted that only one boot had borne the mudstains. It transpired that a policeman, trying to compare footprints, had taken it to the scene and pressed it into the ground. 
but there was one factor more convincing to Conan Doyle than any other. The first sight I ever had of Mr. Edelgy himself was when he came to my London hotel. I'd been delayed and he was waiting in the foyer. I recognized him by his dark face. He was passing the time by reading a newspaper. He held it close to his eyes and rather sideways. Mr. Edelgy. Uh, oh. Please, please, don't, don't get up. My name is Conan Doyle. How do you do, sir? It is do you not you to... suffer from astigmatic myopia? Why, why, yes, but... How I have studied so? eye surgery. Your astigmatism is marked. There's a very high degree of myopia. Don't you wear spectacles? I have wanted to, sir. I have been to opticians, but they have never found a formula to suit my case. Surely this came out at your trial. Have I wanted it to be raised and to call a specialist to confirm it. Then? My legal advisor said the evidence against me was so weak and ridiculous that it would not be necessary. I mean, the idea of such a man scouring fields at night and assaulting cattle while avoiding the watching police was ludicrous to anyone who can imagine what the world looks like to eyes with myopia so hopelessly bad. There, in a single defect, lay the certainty of his innocence. Conan Doyle demonstrated that certainty in a series of newspaper articles, and the public outcry they provoked forced the Home Office to set up an inquiry, and the Law Society, who'd struck Edelgy off, reinstated him. The case helped influence the setting up of the Court of Criminal Appeal, and Conan Doyle cocked a final snook at officialdom by inviting George Edelgy to his wedding reception when he remarried in 1907. But he hadn't been married long to Jean Lecky, who'd been a close platonic friend for many years, before he was leading another campaign for a misjudged man. And this time, the stakes were far higher. The man had been convicted of murder. In 1908, an elderly woman, Miss Gilchrist, was done to death most brutally in her flat in Glasgow. A single diamond brooch was found to have been taken and a box of papers rifled. A brooch fitting the description turned up in a pawn shop and was traced to one Oscar Slater. He was a German Jew of unsavory reputation and he'd recently left hurriedly for America. He was brought back and charged with the murder. It was found beyond all doubt that this brooch had been in Slater's possession for years. But the public had lost its head and so had the police. As one writer in the press put it, even if he didn't do it, he deserved to be condemned. Slater was poor and friendless. He'd lived with a woman, which shocked Scott's morality. He had a clear alibi with a perfectly innocent explanation for going to America abruptly. But as his witnesses were his mistress and his servant girl, it wasn't accepted. He was convicted and condemned to death. Two days before he was to be executed, he was reprieved to life imprisonment. It is an atrocious story, and as I read it and realized the wickedness of it all, I was moved to do all I could for the man. He applied Holmesian reasoning again. He suggested that the murderer had been no stranger to Miss Gilchrist and her financial affairs. A document had been his objective, and the brooch was merely taken as a cover-up. Year by year, while Slater languished in jail, pieces of evidence in support of this came in from several sources. At last, the authorities could ignore the petitions and pressure no longer. Slater was released for good conduct. He'd been in prison nearly 19 years. Sir Conan Doyle, you breaker of my shackles, you lover of truth for justice sake, I thank you from the bottom of my heart for the goodness you have shown towards me. The Slater and Edelgy cases were the ones which concerned him most actively. But he did take a keen interest in others. The Dreyfus affair, Crippen and Roger Casement. He couldn't respect a traitor, but he could pity one. His argument was that Casement's treason had been committed while he was mentally unstable. Casement was executed, and Conan Doyle learned later that he'd lost himself a baronessy by his call for clemency. It's also said, by the way, that he sacrificed a peerage by becoming chief campaigner for so controversial a movement as spiritualism. But I wonder if these blackballings did happen, whether they weren't partly revenged by the establishment for his forcing its hand once or twice too often. The sad fact is that officialdom in England stands solid together and that when you're forced to attack it, you need not expect justice. Rather, you're up against an avowed trade union, the members of which are not going to act a blackleg to each other. What confronts you 
is a determination to admit nothing which inculpates another official. And as to the idea of punishing another official for offences which have caused misery to helpless victims, it never comes within their horizon. The title he did bear came to him in 1902, a knighthood for services to his country, bestowed by his new sovereign, Edward VII. A misguided shop assistant addressed a parcel of shirts to him as Sir Sherlock Holmes and got the dressing down of his life. He'd wanted to decline the honour, as he told his mother. The title I most value is that of doctor, which was conferred by your self-sacrifice and determination. I won't descend from it to another. But his mother was shocked at his idea of rejecting the honourable title of knight. She protested. He resisted. And the argument went to and fro until she pointed out, quite simply, that by refusing, he'd be insulting the monarch. Well, there was no answer to that, and he gave in. Now, we're told by Dr. Watson that in that same year of 1902, Sherlock Holmes was offered a knighthood. But he'd no strong-minded mother to badger him, so he was able to turn it down. And I suspect that whether Conan Doyle was aware of it or not, here's another true parallel between them. To have been Sir Sherlock would have meant becoming, to some extent, beholden to the establishment. He'd have sacrificed some of that strict objectivity and impartiality which he prized so much. As Mr. Sherlock Holmes, consulting detective and self-styled last and highest court of appeal in detection, he could deal as impartially and at times high-handedly with noblemen and even monarchs as he could with the Scotland Yarders. He was answerable to no one but himself, not even to the strict letter of the law. Now, I'm not suggesting Conan Doyle wanted to be free to play tricks with the law, uh, but he certainly clung to his freedom to play old Harry with the politicians, the lawyers, the bureaucrats. Anyone else he believed stood in the way of a natural justice for the underdog. My dearest ma'am, I don't think you will resent my pamphlet, The War in South Africa, its cause and conduct, for it attacks no one else but only defends ourselves and our own methods. And especially the soldiers who have behaved beautifully and have been most cruelly slandered. There is no word too harsh to apply to such a man as Stead, who, safe at home, concocts the most outrageous and false charges against them. I collect all the evidence in one small book which shall be sold at sixpence and translated and circulated in every European country. He'd served in the Boer War as an unpaid surgeon in charge of a volunteer field hospital. It was hard, dangerous work, treating the wounded and victims of enteric fever. Stories started being fed to the press by Boer sympathizers that women and children who'd been moved to refugee camps for their own safety were being raped and murdered by the British troops. The stories were fostered by the German press and eagerly seized on by such sensation mongers back home as W.T. Stead. Night and day, the whole hellish panorama is unrolled in South Africa. And we know that before sunset, British troops will be steadily adding more items of horror to the ghastly total. There were no official denials of it. Inarticulate Tommy Atkins, soldiering on in this unhappy war, had no one to speak out for him. So Conan Doyle undertook it, in a book-length pamphlet drawing on hundreds of letters and statements. Every penny from sales went to pay for those translations, to be circulated, sometimes free, in other countries. Hundreds of thousands of copies were distributed, and Tommy Atkins' detractors fell silent. And then Conan Doyle spelt out some other lessons of the war. Let us have done with the fancy tailoring the luxurious habits of the mess, the unnecessary extravagance. Officers should not be marked out for targets by wearing distinctive dress. Artillery should not be drawn up in rows to be destroyed wholesale by the first well-aimed shell. Traditional cavalry lances should be abandoned in favour of rifles. In fact, it would be no bad thing for every man and youth in Great Britain to learn to shoot the regular army would never stand a chance of repulsing an invasion. 
and a decade later, when there was little doubt left that invasion was becoming a real menace, he was sounding a more urgent, a more specific warning. The element of danger is the existence of new forms of warfare. These are the submarine and the airship. The airship, save as a means of acquiring information, does not seem to be formidable, but it is different with the submarine. In an article, Great Britain and the Next War, he proposed a threefold preparation against blockade. A channel tunnel, a self-supporting agricultural economy, and an adequate deterrent to the submarine menace. He made the point to an even wider public with a short story, Danger, in the Strand magazine. He invited the editor to print the opinions of naval experts. Uh, some supported him, but as for the rest... Submarines have no doubt been much improved in recent years, and their radius of action made much greater than formerly. But I'm afraid they're not yet capable of the wonderful performances described. I'm compelled to say that I think Sir A. Conan Doyle's story most improbable. More like one of Jules Verne's. I do not myself think that any civilization will torpedo unarmed and defenseless merchant ships. I do not believe that territorial waters will be violated or neutral vessels sunk. No nation would permit it. And the officer who did it would be shot. Two years later, the German naval secretary was able to tell the Reichstag... The German people can thank the British Admiralty for disregarding the warning on U-boat warfare given by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. When war came and warnings were no longer any use, he turned his mind to ways of helping men survive in the sea. He organized the manufacture of an inflatable swimming collar. He pleaded for every sailor to have a life jacket and greater numbers of collapsible boats carried. And then he noted that French soldiers were issued with steel helmets, so why not the British? Winston Churchill supported him, and Conan Doyle's garden at Crowborough in Sussex rang with his own test shots against different types of metal. All the same, he would have preferred a more active role. Sir, I have been told that there may be some difficulty in finding officers for the new army. I think I may say that my name is well known to the younger men of this country and that if I were to take a commission at my age, it would set an example. I am 55, but I am very strong and hardy and can make my voice audible at great distances, which is useful at drill. He was turned down, but for a time that drillmaster's voice rang out over the Ashdown Forest as he paraded his own forerunner of Dad's army, the Civilian Reserve. It was the first organization of its kind. I wrote a description of our methods to the Times. As a consequence, I received requests for our rules and methods from 1,200 towns and villages. We drilled every day, though with no weapons. Then there came an order from the War Office. All unauthorized bodies to be at once disbanded. The company was on parade. I read out the telegram and then said, Right turn. Dismiss. With this laconic order, the civilian reserve dissolved forever. But his hint had been taken again. An official volunteer force was formed, and number 184343, Private Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, served in it all through the war. He went to several war fronts as an observer, and he got to know the commanders in the field. Their private opinions helped him when he came to write his lengthy chronicle, The British Campaign in France and Flanders. He felt his late fifties were the physical climax of his life. He'd always been a terrific sports player. He was goalkeeper and fullback for Portsmouth before the team became professional. And the boy street fighter turned into a good amateur boxer. He excelled at cricket. He played for MCC 75 times as an all-rounder and once he took W.G. Grace's wicket. In the game of billiards was amateur championship standard. As a pioneer motorist, he represented Britain in an early international rally. And using Norwegian ski, he introduced the sport of skiing to Switzerland, which has done quite well from it ever since. But the war brought more than physical climax to his many-sided life. Seven members of his own and his wife's family served in it. Only one survived. Among the dead were two very near and dear to him. His brother, Brigadier General Innes Doyle, 
and his son, Captain Kingsley Conan Doyle. It brought to a head long years of investigation into what to him now became a supreme matter of life and death. In 1887, some curious psychical experiences came my way. And especially I was impressed by the fact of telepathy, which I proved for myself by experiment with a friend. The question then arose, if two incarnate minds could communicate, is it possible for a discarnate mind to communicate with one that is still in the body? For more than 20 years, I examined the evidence and came finally to the conclusion beyond all doubt that such communication was possible. The full importance of the matter did not come home to me until the war, when all the world was asking, where are our dead boys? And getting such unsatisfactory answers, both from the churches and from science. Then it was that my wife and I felt that our knowledge on the subject was of in enormous importance, and that we could answer this universal question. They undertook speaking engagements in many parts of the world, at the same time, he went on writing books, working for many other causes. The strain taxed even his great strength. Heart trouble developed, and on July the 7th, 1930, he died, aged 71. There's no doubt that the urgency he felt about the need to reassure people that the death of the body wasn't the end of the story cut short his own earthly life by a good many years. You are yourself. Sherlock Holmes. Dr. Joseph Bell's methods had provided the inspiration for Holmes. But as Bell told Conan Doyle in later years, creator and creation were essentially one. There are many links between them, both superficial and deep. And the perpetuators of Sherlock Holmes mythology tend to ignore the author and regard Holmes as the product of some sort of immaculate conception. And of course there are all those other people who believe he really did live and they come to London expecting to find 221B Baker Street preserved as a national monument. And yet, however we foster Sherlock Holmes's immortality as detective, man of action, humanitarian, patriot, champion of the underdog, smiter of the evildoer and the oppressor, we're automatically paying tribute to the man who distilled in him so many of his own qualities. So why not let Mr. Sherlock Holmes have the final word on them both. I think I may go so far as to say that I have not lived wholly in vain. If my record were closed tonight, I could still survey it with equanimity. In over a thousand cases, I am not aware that I have ever used my powers upon the wrong side. In The Man Who Was Sherlock Holmes, Frank Finlay played Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. Sherlock Holmes was played by Dennis Hawthorne, Dr. Watson, Gordon Reed, Louise Conan Doyle, Eve Karp, Dr. Joseph Bell, John Bott, George Edelgy, Baba Bhatti, and Admiral Domville, Alexander John. The programme was written and presented by Michael Hardwick and directed by Peter King.